uh, John, is my slide deck visible? Yep, you are good to go. Okay, great, thank you. So today um, I'm going to talk about some common scenarios with uh, always-on availability groups. The most common scenario that uh, everyone, fa everyone faces uh, is trying to tie down what latency uh, is plaguing your availability group. If everything's working fine, then you don't need to be bothered about it. But during a reactive situation, uh, that is one of the most common reasons Microsoft uh, engineers are asked to assist our customers. The second most common reason why customers call us uh, regarding availability group issues is associated with failovers or root cause for failovers. So that's another thing I'm going to cover today. Uh, before I go ahead, um, I'll go ahead and quickly introduce myself. Um, I work as a senior program manager uh, with the Microsoft SQL Server product group, uh, the Tiger team. I've been with Microsoft for nearly a decade. Uh, in the past, in this particular virtual chapter, I did another session on uh, some of the supportability enhancements that my team had shipped uh, for troubleshooting uh, some of the common issues that I'm going to talk about today. I'm going to briefly touch upon them uh, just to set the context and uh, uh, feel free to ask any questions over the chat and uh, I'll be more than happy to answer them. So let's talk about latency. Um, in an availability group, if everything's running fine, uh, you're good. But if it's not, then it can be daunting uh, to troubleshoot latency during a outage situation or even during a slowness. Um, I know all of you have heard of this added slow and steady wins the race. When it comes to availability groups, that's not really true. Um, it's pretty much the fast and steady wins the race. As long as you have a steady flow of traffic, which is predictable, which you know performs at a steady pace and is within your SLA, you know that it is going to be uh, business as usual. The moment the pace falls down, that's when you need to be bothered. Uh, there are two ways to uh, look at an availability group. Um, the first one is to look at the dashboard in the management studio, which gives you a fairly decent view of the availability group itself. It shows you what the availability group can do um, in terms of uh, throughput. It'll give you uh, the uh, status of the availability group, the log send rate, uh, the redo rate. There are some nuances about the dashboard, which I'll talk about when I'm going through my demo. Uh, but one of the important key things to keep in mind is that uh, if you are uh, looking at the log send rate and are confused about why it's showing values which don't match uh, your throughput, uh, then either you're missing um, the particular KB that you see on your screen right now um, and you have some amount of uh, uh, information which you need about your log generation rate. We'll talk about how to compare the log send rate and the actual log generation rate on your SQL Server instances when I'm talking through the demo. Um, now the important thing to keep in mind is when you have more than one replica, the amount of send that the primary replica has to do is more than one. And when we are measuring the log send rate in the management studio, it's a uh, time-based average, uh, whereas the counters, which a number of these monitoring tools that you have uh, uh, either deployed uh, by purchasing off the market or you've built on your own uh, using perfmon counters and DMVs, uh, track uh, the throughput at a per second interval. So when you're comparing the dashboard uh, which uses the DMV and the perform counters, there might be a difference which could be confusing at times. So before I go further, uh, let me talk about uh, SQL Server 2016 uh, and how your throughput, which if it's not performing optimally, can result in latency in your environment. In SQL Server 2016, there has been a big amount of improvement in the availability group transport layer. So we use about eight worker thread context switches to transport one log block, which means the moment you do a transaction, when a log block is generated on the primary replica, uh, we can transport it to the secondary replica uh, in 50% of uh, 
50% lesser context switches, so which is a huge gain in throughput. Uh, with some of the changes that we have done in terms of log throughput, log transport layer, uh, and applying the logs on the secondary for the redo, uh, we have been able to achieve a 95% uh, of transaction log throughput rate with a single synchronous secondary. Now, if you look at the graph over here, on the right hand side of the of the slide, you would see that the blue line corresponds to a standalone replica which is delivering uh, transactions um, uh, at a certain rate. The orange line which is a synchronous replica without encryption is able to keep up for the most part um, at the same pace as the standalone instance which is functioning without an availability group configuration. So what this says is in 2016 your OLTP workloads uh, would perform as optimally as possible uh, up to 95% of the transaction log throughput as compared to when it did not have availability groups configured. If you compare that with SQL Server 2014 uh, with a synchronous uh, replica without encryption, uh, the throughput as the number of concurrent workers increased uh, dropped quite a bit. That, that can be challenging. So if you have uh, if you compare the extreme ends of the spectrum, if you have 400 uh, odd concurrent threads running, the difference between the, if I, let me use my laser pointer here, the difference between the peak of the standalone replica and the peak of the uh, synchronous replica on SQL Server 2014 uh, tends to be quite a bit. And that could definitely lead to perceived latency issues because if you were functioning uh, at at this particular rate uh, at nearly 300 me megabits per second and if you move to about 88 uh, you would obviously start raising some alarm bells. Now compare that with synchronous replicas with encryption we're still able to get a pretty good throughput which is the gray line uh, even though uh, we're using encryption and a synchronous replica. So all, so in summary SQL Server 2016 performs uh, much better from a log throughput and performance standpoint. Uh, so if you're considering looking at SQL Server uh, and you're, if you're looking to availability groups, uh, then uh, I would recommend using SQL Server 2016. Moving on, if you had attended uh, my previous slide, uh, sorry, my previous uh, session uh, at this virtual chapter, uh, I had presented a view like this, uh, what you see on, on your screens right now. Uh, which basically shows you the primary replica commit time and it also shows you uh, the statistics from the secondary replica uh, which allows you to track down uh, latency uh, to a fair degree of accuracy. Uh, what that is going to do is it's, it's going to allow you uh, to track how much time is it taking uh, between a time period for the primary replica to actually commit and if it is running in synchronous commit mode um, then you would also be able to track down how much of time does it take uh, to go ahead and uh, wait for the second replica to send send a response. So all of this is uh, is basically a culmination of the troubleshooting enhancements that we shipped in SQL Server uh, 2012 Service Pack 3, SQL Server 2014 Service Pack 2, um, and in a future update for SQL Server 2016, we would have these extended events there as well. Uh, any questions so far? Okay, going ahead. So, if I had to drill down into the bottom half of the table, which is actually showing the hard numbers, uh, the commit time basically tells you how much time it took for the primary replica to commit a transaction. The remote hardened time is basically telling uh, us the average time it's taking for the second replicas to uh, commit or basically uh, how much time the primary replica has to wait uh, to receive a hardened response from the secondary replicas. Um, and on the secondary replica side, it tells us how much time is it taking to apply a transaction and how much time it takes to receive. If I look at these numbers, it's very evident that uh, the secondary uh, replica is basically applying stuff pretty quickly and it's receiving um, stuff 
pretty quickly as well. So there's not really a lot of latency on the secondary replica. Uh, the primary replica is sending uh, across data pretty fast, but it seems to be waiting uh, for the remote hardened message to come through. So if the primary is doing its work like the way it should be and the secondary is doing the same, then the third component in the picture is the network. Uh, and when I had captured this particular uh, data snapshot, I was introducing uh, a latency on the network uh, using uh, a tool which would apply a 50 millisecond latency uh, to every TCP packet that was being transferred. So which is why the network latency is showing up. So while talking through the slide, I was able to drill down into which uh, uh, part of the always on availability group topology was actually causing the slowdown. So let's go ahead and move on to the next slide. Um, now these are the Perfmon counters that we added. Um, and as you can see, you get a lot more information from the Perfmon counters uh, associated with your compression rate, your compression uh, cache rate, uh, decompression rate, uh, if flow control is being applied, um, whenever you're troubleshooting slow uh, performance for your availability groups, one of the things to look at is flow control, uh, which means that are too many messages uh, being generated uh, on the primary uh, that the always-on replica has decided to basically halt or throttle the transactions. So whenever uh, there is flow control being kicked in, uh, that is a sign that your instance is not able to keep up. You even get additional insights into encryption and decryption rates. Uh, you also get information about uh, the send and receive uh, flow controls at the transport layer. Um, and other than that, there are also a bunch of uh, extended events which we were looking at in the previous slide. So the graph was built using uh, all of these extended events. So the compression times and the decompression times came from the HADR underscore log underscore block compression. Uh, the, uh, and the decompression gives me the decompression time. The uh, send time is measured using the, uh, the HADR log block send complete. Uh, the time it took to uh, apply the log block is received from HADR underscore apply underscore log block and uh, the capture log block gives us the capture time. So all of these extended events put together along with the duration it took uh, for the event to complete uh, gives us uh, good information about uh, the amount of time it takes for the primary replica to send data across to the second replica and for the second replica to apply those uh, transactions. So let me switch over to one of my uh, SQL Server instances which has uh, an availability group configured and let me go ahead and, and show you what, what kind of configuration I have. So I currently have a um, two node replica in my cluster, both of them are standalone instances. Um, I have a AG called test AG configured. Um, this is uh, running SQL Server 2012 uh, and if I look at my availability group configuration, I can see that uh, the Tiger AG1 SQL Server instance is currently the primary instance and uh, Tiger AG2 is the secondary replica. Um, let me go ahead and show you the properties. Um, when I look at the properties, um, you will notice that the, the AG1 is the primary replica and AG2 is the secondary replica, as I mentioned. The availability mode is asynchronous and uh, readable secondary is configured for my replicas. So now I'm going to go ahead and uh, try and generate a few transactions. Um, so 
let me go ahead and open up my SQL script, which which is pretty simple. What what it's going to do is it's going to insert uh, a thousand rows into a table. Um, before I do that, I am going to start up a perfmon with uh, two counters um, and. What, what that's going to do is, for my environment, let me go ahead and add the counters real quick. And I'm going to add counters from my secondary replica. So the counters that I'm interested in are the log bytes uh, redone and the log bytes uh, sent. So, for some reason, this is not showing up. So, just give me a moment before I pull up the counters. And the reason for pulling up the perfmon as opposed to pulling it through the uh, DMV sys.dmos perfmon counters is because uh, it doesn't really give you a perspective of the change or the pattern that you would see. So it's uh, always good to look at it in a, in a graphical format. So let me go ahead and add the counters. Um, that should be really quick. I'm looking for the AG2 and I'm looking for the counter database replica. So I'm going to select the test AG. Um, I'm going to use uh, the read, redone bytes per second and I'm going to use the log bytes received counters. I'm going to highlight them and I'm going to get rid of my processor time. <clears throat> hmm, for some reason, again, I got that wrong. So again, going back to database replica, and I've done redone bytes, log bytes received per second. Adding it. Okay. Done. Okay. <clears throat> so now we have uh, those two counters added. It's not. <clears throat> sorry, it's not showing up because uh, of the resolution here. Um, now let me go ahead and do the transactions, and you get to see the counter spiking up. So I'm going to insert um, a single row and go back. Um, I don't see a difference. Now, let me go ahead and insert the loop and see if I see a small jump. Yes, I can see uh, both those counters showing up, the log bytes received and the log redone bytes. And you can see that there is a pattern. Um, and it's finished a 1,000 rows. I'm going to try that again. And we should see a same kind of um, small ragged plateau pattern showing up. Now let's see what we see in the dashboard which I was talking about. So the SQL Server failover dash, uh, always on dashboard uh, gives you the redo rate, the send rate, um, and the last commit rate. Uh, you can right click on Hi, each Emmett. of the... Hi, yes. Oh. I mean, I just wanted to, to throw a, a couple of questions at you, kind of based over the demo here. One of the one of the attendees was asking about: Is Perfmon the only way to get to these metrics, or could you also get to this through the normal DMVs as well? Good question. Um, I'm going to reserve the answer for that uh, because I'm going to explain okay. exactly what the uh, uh, participant asked. So. The DMV is what builds up the dashboard, and what you're seeing here, uh, the log send rate, is exactly what I'm talking about. So the log send rate is basically an average uh, of the throughput that your availability group's primary replica is sending at during an active period. Now, notice that 
right now, even though my uh, default refresh rate is 30 seconds, my send rate is at a static of 4602. I'm not doing any transactions on my system. Uh, I'm not doing um, any write activity. Um, but the important point to keep in mind is the um, last sent time. So the current time on my system is 526 p.m., uh, whereas the last sent time on the replicas is 525. So that basically tells you that the DMV only gives you information while the availability group is active, um, whereas the perform counter is a per second counter. You see everything is zero right now. So if you are measuring uh, per second latency or if you are measuring throughput or benchmarking throughput within your environment, uh, then my recommendation is to use uh, the perfmon counters. Uh, the, what you see in the dashboard is an approximation uh, of your send rate while uh, the replica is active. Uh, during that period, it's going to give you uh, some accurate numbers. Uh, so now let's do this for the next two batches where I'm inserting a uh, thousand rows and let's look at Perfmon. Again, I'm seeing those uh, FATO patterns. Now if I go back and check again, my throughput rate has increased and my last commit time, which in the next refresh, it will uh, update itself, that would change as well. So. If you want instantaneous point-in-time reference and if you want to base alerts on them, um, operational kind of alerts, then Perfmon would be the way to go. Uh, if you want to make a decision of whether the replica is behind or while you're troubleshooting uh, your environment, uh, then the dashboard uh, gives a good indication of if anything is being sent or not. Uh, and it's an average uh, over the uh, active time period. Now notice that now that the transactions are complete, uh, the last send time has now been updated uh, to what the current time is because the transactions just finished. Uh, now if I don't do any transactions on my replica, then again these times uh, will continue to stay static. Uh, and John, I'm hoping uh, that answered uh, uh, the question. Uh, if not, uh, I could take follow-up questions right now. Yep. No, I, I, I think that does. Great. So while we are looking at the dashboard and while we're looking at the send rates, uh, what I've also done is I've compiled all of this information into a, a uh, availability group uh, dashboard in Power BI Desktop. Uh, and again, you can see that all of this information is uh, pretty much being pulled uh, from the DMV uh, and if I click on refresh right now, what it's going to what it's going to do is uh, oh, let me let me go ahead and add the data collection layer on top. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a table in my TemDB, and then I'm going to go ahead and start doing the same amount of inserts, and let's see what uh, what my DMV um, shows and using the Power BI desktop dashboard, we should be able to get a good picture. Now what I wanted to show here is while the data is being generated, I wanted to show uh, the first half of the graph which you see on the left, which is the log send rate and the redo rate. The log send rate tends to keep rising and this is what I've taken during an active period. That's because this is a frequency at which the data is being sent so if you have bandwidth available on the replica, this is going to keep rising till it plateaus out. Uh, the redo rate is also going to be at a high uh, till there is nothing else to be redone, especially if you're running an asynchronous replica. Uh, and the log send rates and the redo rates would continue to stay uh, at a static number on a system which is performing optimally. Uh, on a system where it's not uh, during active periods, you would see a, um, a fluctuating uh, graph uh, which would tell you that there are uh, some concerns uh, with the performance of that particular environment. So let me go ahead and stop the data collection. Um, 
let me go ahead and pull that information into uh, the dashboard and see what we can find. So th this is going ahead and connecting to my TempDB and it's going to lo load all the uh, data into uh, these charts and as you can see um, it continued to rise and once there is nothing to send it continued to stay static. Similarly uh, the redo um, I did it in bursts data came in got redone data came in got redone and that pattern follows. So when you're looking at the dashboard in conclusion when you're looking at the dashboard keep in mind that the log send rate is an average uh, it's a indication of how your uh, throughput is being measured while the instance is actively sending data to its secondary replicas, uh, whereas the perfmon counter gives you a point in time per second uh, value. Uh, and if you're setting up op operational alerts, you should be using perfmon. If you're reactively troubleshooting the environment, uh, then the always on dashboard uh, gives you a good indication. And if you want to get really uh, scientific about the data, then uh, the uh, then you can actually create an extended event session um, using the events that I talked about earlier uh, in my slide deck, which gives you uh, much more granular information up to microseconds of how much time it's taking to send, how much time it takes to get a remote act from the secondary replica, and how much time uh, it takes you to do the various tasks in between. Um, the session configuration uh, is pretty straightforward. Uh, all you need to do is use those um, events which I had pointed out uh, earlier uh, in my slide deck, add them to an extended event session, um, and um, what, what you need to be uh, worried about is the, the time-based fields. Um, I already have, uh, like processing time, um, the time to commit. I already have these scripts uploaded on GitHub. Uh, once I complete the session, uh, I'll point you to the GitHub link, which has uh, uh, that information. So I'm going to move back to my slide deck. Let me switch over. And uh, I'm going to move over to uh, the next section, uh, which is uh, troubleshooting failovers. So in uh, SQL Server 2016, 2014 Service Pack 2, and 2012 Service Pack 3, uh, we introduced uh, a new uh, event, uh, the lease renewal, uh, and the availability group uh, lease expired event uh, was improved uh, for additional logging. Uh, we also log additional messages in the uh, cluster logs whenever a lease timeout happens. So a lease timeout is basically um, a heartbeat check for your replica. It gives you information uh, of whether the replica is basically alive or not, uh, to put it very simply. And this happens every five seconds, so if there is a time period where the replica is not responding, the lease will time out, and that could eventually lead to a failover. Uh, when that happens, the cluster log now will have additional information. Uh, one of the reasons that we have found uh, in, a, in a number of customer cases that we worked on is uh, the lease timeout tends to happen uh, when there is additional system pressure on the secondary replica or the primary replica uh, and this could be due to um, high CPU usage um, or very high disk usage or a combination of both uh, which is why you will see in the additional messages we're even uh, writing out the amount of uh, processor time being consumed, the average disk reads and writes and the uh, available uh, physical memory on the box so that you get an indication of what the system resource usage looked like uh, when the lease time had actually happened. So let's look at what failover troubleshooting would involve. The first thing, obviously, that I talked about, you would look at the re renewal. It happens every five seconds. If it doesn't, there's a problem. The SQL Server instance is not responding. Um, then when a lease expires, we raise an extended event, uh, availability group lease expired, and uh, that information basically tells you when the lease actually expired. Um, and post that, you can go look at the additional logs available in the log folder to find out what was the state of the system. Any questions? 
Uh, yes, we have a couple that have came in since our last time going through, though. Um, is there any expected uh, performance overhead for the latency system that you had showing in your previous demo? Okay, so for what I was running uh, in the T-SQL script for capturing DMV outputs, uh, no, um, there isn't. Uh, for the extended events, which captures the latency at a much more granular level, the new extended events, those are uh, meant for reactive troubleshooting. Uh, we don't recommend having them turned on 24-7 in a production environment. It's only when you know that there is a latent environment and the way you would find out that your environment is latent and if you're, is if you're looking at your perfmon or you're mo automatically monitoring them uh, or you are um, capturing a trend based on the uh, send and receive rates uh, uh, obtained from the HADR DMVs, uh, which is... Uh, showing a different trend from the baseline. Awesome. And then the new uh, columns that you showed in the report built in the Management Studio and some of the perfmon counters, are those available in previous versions of SQL Server with the KB article that you mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, or are these just for SQL Server 2016? Okay. So um, the question is about the columns, the additional columns that I showed in the Always On dashboard, those have been there. Uh, those are not new to SQL Server 2016, so all you need to do is right click and get to those counters. Um, when I start my uh, demo again for failover troubleshooting, uh, I will show you how to get to those additional columns. Um, those will be available in older versions of uh, Management Studio as well. Awesome. Thanks, Simit. Thank you. Okay, going back to my presentation. Um, so let's talk about which versions have it. As I mentioned, all of this information is available in all versions that support availability groups 2012, 2014, 2016. Uh, now, when you actually have a failover, what do you want to collect? When you actually have a failover, the first thing you want to do is collect the SQL Server error log uh, from the time of the failure. The Windows uh, and the system application event logs uh, from the time of the failure also should be collected. Uh, these can be quite valuable, especially if you're having uh, some sort of driver or firmware related issues or uh, disk controller related issues. Uh, these are very valuable to look into. Uh, we also have something called the failover cluster instance diagnostic logs. Uh, we maintain a maximum of 10 rollover files in the SQL Server log folder. Uh, these are also extended event uh, log files. Uh, and then there's the always on extended event uh, health session. We maintain four of them and we maintain uh, uh, system health session log files in the log folder. And obviously the Windows cluster log to take advantage of the uh, enhanced logging that we do uh, in 2012, 2014, and 2016. So let me switch over to my uh, virtual machine again and now before I move over to the failure troubleshooting demo uh, to the question of how do we get those additional columns uh, when you launch the availability uh, group or always on dashboard from management studio if you right click uh, on the uh, columns, you will have the option to pick pick the additional uh, columns, like the last read on time, or if you want uh, um, synchronization performance, you get to pick all of these, and the the dashboard also allows you to group by. Um, or you can click on the add remove columns it gives you the same kind of view you can do the same for the replicas uh, it lets you allow it allows you to add additional columns as well uh, now the the SQL Server error log whenever there is a failover it gives you a whole lot of verbose information uh, but let's concentrate uh, our efforts right now on the different extended events that we have for troubleshooting uh, failures 
So the first thing um, I want to look at is the always on health events. Now these are rollover files uh, and we maintain only four of them. Uh, you can look at the configuration uh, right here if I right click and click on properties. By default on any SQL Server instance when you start um, or create an availability group uh, we create an always on health session uh, which captures uh, the following events. Um, always on DDL executed. Uh, so if you're doing an alter on your availability group, it would get captured in this particular uh, extend, extended event session. Um, uh, we also capture when the lease expired. Uh, we capture uh, when there's an automatic failover validation um, and uh, when there's a state change. Um, when there's a failover, there's a state change. Uh, any errors reported by the availability group uh, and uh, uh, we also capture uh, information about uh, redo being blocked. And now, why is that important? Why, why are we specifically looking at redo being blocked? Uh, whenever there's a failover off the availability group, uh, the database actually restarts and a redo process is initiated. Uh, so at that time, if the redo thread gets blocked, your database will not come online post the failover, which means that uh, the failover process will not complete and your applications will not be able to access uh, uh, the environment and that is going to lead to a downtime uh, or business downtime. Uh, so which is why we add the lock redo uh, blocked event uh, which allows you to quickly determine if the redo thread is being blocked by any other process uh, or by a system thread uh, and allows you to take corrective action. Um, the corrective action obviously is not automated. Now, if I look at the always on uh, health session, um, I can actually group uh, these events together. So the first thing um, I can do is click on grouping. Um, I can group by name. Uh, and you can see that the state change is the maximum number of events uh, reported here. So let's go ahead and check what I will be able to see. Um, it, it tells me what are the different states it transitioned from. Uh, whether we're spending online, offline, and I have been uh, shutting down my instances uh, in between demos. So obviously there's a lot of online and offline uh, transitions. Uh, the different errors reported in the event, uh, and this is basically um, some of the events which are reported in the error log, and based on the destination that you see, um, you will know where these messages are being uh, put into the, uh, whether they're being going to the error log or whether they're going to the event log, based on the destination you would be able to track them down uh, in those logs as well. Um, additionally, we also have uh, the lease expired which I talked about and this is important. It tells you that the lease was not valid which is why it expired. Um, Again, if you go back to a recording that I did for the previous virtual chapter session, um, I talk about this in detail and there are Power BI dashboards associated just with uh, the lease expired uh, event. Uh, the always on DDL executed is important. Um, that's because it tells you what command was executed during, uh, during that time. I can see that uh, I'm modify the replica to asynchronous commit. This is what I did um, at a previous time um, to change it from asynchronous commit for the uh, set of demos that I'm running. It also gives you state changes, uh, primary pending, primary normal. It basically shows you the transition from the different states. Um, so this is the first thing that I would look at. Because there are only four files maintained, uh, you might not be able to uh, clean a lot of information. If you have not captured uh, this information up front, um, the other option is uh, to go ahead and uh, and look at uh, the failover cluster diagnostics log. Um, now this is basically uh, a set of extended events which are available in the um, in the log folder again and this information is quite useful because it maintains 10 rollover files uh, of 100 megs uh, 
each. So you can actually have uh, about a gig of data uh, in your log folder, um, especially if you did not know that a failover happened. Uh, these could be a gold mine uh, to dig through and find out why the actual failover happened. So let's go ahead and, and look through um, one of these uh, logs. Um, John, uh, any questions? No, okay. So let me show you what this has. This also has similar kind of information. Um, along with some additional information about your system health. So the first thing is the state change. Um, it gives you information about the system being healthy or not, uh, which is always uh, good to know because you probably might not have information about uh, what the system health look like. Uh, and as Murphy's Law has it, whenever you have a failure, even though you had monitoring, it was not able to capture uh, the data that you require to troubleshoot. So having this uh, at the back of your pocket is very useful. Uh, I also get the availability group is a live failure. It basically tells me that my group, uh, my replica died. Um, I get to see component information. So to give a brief summary about what the component health result means, um, in SQL Server 2012, and above, we started capturing the SP underscore server underscore diagnostics uh, stored procedure output uh, in the SQL diag uh, XCL file. Uh, we also capture this information in the system health extended event session, but having this information uh, in the historical data allows you to correlate what the system performance looked like uh, when there was an actual failure. So let me actually Go ahead and uh, add some additional columns um, uh, to make this a bit more easier. So, for example, uh, I'm going to add component type and I'm going to add component uh, to this data set. And then I'm going to group by component and now that I've grouped by component, I get to see some additional information about the system. For example, if I double click on this data, I get to see um, if there were any access violations, if there were any uh, uh, memory dumps, non-yielding situations. Um, all of this data is kind of daunting to sift through if you're doing this for the first time. Uh, again, um, if you noticed in my folder, I had a Power BI dashboard file, uh, which allows me to sift through this data uh, much more quickly. So what you can do is you can merge all of this data uh, when you open up all these extended event files. Um, you have the option of merging extended event files. And when you do that, you'll get the information, you'll get the option of adding all the event files and then clicking on OK. Uh, management Studio will merge all of them for you and then you can go to extended events and export and you can go to table. It would ask you uh, which database and which table you want to load all of this data to. Uh, the other option is you can run T-SQL commands to import all of this data. Um, and the third option is you can use uh, um, API calls, uh, the um, extended event link reader. Uh, to import directly from the file without having to uh, use T-SQL commands. So uh, what I've done is I've imported all of this data into a Power BI dashboard. Um, I have taken all the different components, the system component, the IO subsystem, the query processing uh, uh, components, and put all of them into a dashboard. So uh, now let's see how far back can I go. So I captured this data yesterday, but because I have historical data, I'm able to go back all the way to July. Uh, keep in mind that uh, I, I have kept my instance shut down for quite a few days. But the reason I'm showing you this is even though if you did not have data collection tools in place, you still might be able to do a uh, 
sufficient enough root cause analysis using uh, uh, the extended event files that are available in your log folder and by using a dashboard similar to this. So uh, let's look at my AG resource because I want to identify the times when I had a failover. Uh, so these are my uh, Lee's validity times and I can see that uh, on various days um, I had failure. So let's look at 8.11 and I can go ahead and filter all of this data. Uh, so let me go ahead and filter uh, by that particular date. So I can say is uh, after, uh, let's say, August 11th. So let me take August 10th, 12 a.m. and and is before August 13. So I can see that there is a very good indication of where it actually failed. So it failed at, at this particular time. If I do a mouse over, it tells me at 334 um, there was a, a failure. And I can see that there was a state change associated with that particular time at, at 332 and 334 and that correlates with that white space. So every five seconds I was having Elise uh, check which was validated after uh, a particular time it wasn't. So let me see if I can find out uh, what actually failed during that time. Uh, so let me uh, look at the event time uh, 8, 11, let me start in ascending order so that it's easier for me to read. So at 3.33 at that time, um, I can see that my events were being logged. Uh, it said stopped health worker and uh, at that particular time I had a timeout. So my instance was not responding. I did not have automatic failover configured, so it did not fail over, which is why you don't see the state changes. Um, it shows that at that time it disconnected from SQL Server, and that was about the time that I had shut down the instance. So even though I don't have data collected from that period, uh, just by looking at the log folder, um, I was able to extract all of that information. And if I go to my query processing uh, and I look at those dates uh, uh, for 811, I should be able to get that information as well. Um, so that's, a, that's quite a bit down um, right there. 811, I can see what my system looked like. I did not have any pending tasks, so I can confirm that um, there, there wasn't a problem on my instance um, related to additional user workload coming in. Uh, my IO stats looked fine. Um, I can again go check on that if I want. If I can drill down, that should give me sufficient information again. At 8, uh, I, I don't see any reds in there. All of them are actually green, so I'm good there as well. Um, my memory usage, um, I have a graph for this, so uh, at that time it just dropped. So obviously I did something at that time and I know that I shut down my instance uh, at that time. Um, no fatal issues, no access violations, no latch warnings, no non-yield, no crop pages. So by using this information you were able to pull out uh, a lot of information related to your instance's health and how the availability group resource was behaving. Um, this information that you're seeing on this page is per availability group. In this case, it's Tiger AG. If you had more than one, then you would see more than uh, uh, one particular uh, color in the graph. Um, any questions, John? Uh, let me pull them up here. We have a couple. Um, one is: Have you 
Have you seen any latency or AG problems depending on the amount of databases that exist in an AG or multiple availability groups, so like total of all databases that are highly available with AGs? I think basically that the person is looking for some kind of guidance on how many databases could be in an AG or even be involved in a replica uh, before you start to notice worker thread issues or some other issues. Yeah, good, good question. Um, so I'm going to try and answer this uh, uh, briefly because that could be a session by itself. Yep. Um, so uh, the way to look at availability groups is basically the amount of physical memory, uh, the number of CPUs, and the number of worker threads that you have. Uh, those pretty much will govern the scalability of uh, your environment with respect to the number of databases that you put into the configuration. Um, if you if you look at um, if you look at the previous slide that I talked about on the previous slide, I showed how many context switches we had to do to move a log block from one replica to the other. Uh, on SQL Server 2016, the scalability limit is higher. Um, on SQL Server uh, uh, 2014 and uh, 2016. Uh, sorry, in 2014 and 2012, uh, because of the number of threads involved, uh, the number of databases that you could put uh, inside an AG uh, would differ. So the way you would have to do the calculation is look at your physical memory, uh, look at how many uh, databases will be acting as a primary replica on that particular instance, uh, the number of databases that would be acting as the secondary uh, on that particular instance, uh, and then we have a KV article which provides uh, information uh, about how many threads are required for 2012 and 2014. Uh, and you can do the math, and then you can get to a number. Um, I would maintain at least uh, a 5 to 10 percent buffer, and I would also make sure that I benchmark the system for the number of worker threads required to satisfy my application workload, uh, because the total number of worker threads uh, for the availability group transport and maintenance is shared between uh, that uh, between the AG uh, system threads and your SQL Server uh, instance for certain operations. In SQL Server 2016, we optimized that, but again, the calculation uh, is still valid. So uh, I don't have a hard number. It depends on the physical memory, the total number of CPUs and the number of databases acting as primary or secondary. Yeah. Any additional questions, John? Yep. Yeah, no, great. Now, I would add to that that I think that your last demo also highlights that as well to where you can look at worker threads that are currently being used and being idle. So it looks like your, your report can help monitor that as well that, that you have in your demo. Yes. Um, absolutely. So... So what John's talking about is the query processing section. So this gives you, this pulls information from your system. So if you um, are just not sure how many worker threads are being consumed on your system, what you can actually do is you can just pull uh, a SQL Server uh, system health session log from your uh, uh, instance, uh, import this into uh, the Power BI dashboard, uh, and uh, look at how many uh, workers are created and, and how many pending tasks you have. That would give you a good indication of what your, uh, your throughput should look like. So um, if you just want to do uh, benchmarking of uh, uh, the system health session, um, we, I also have a uh, uh, Power BI uh, dashboard on GitHub, so let me pull that up on the screen. Um, if I, if you go to Tiger Toolbox, uh, which is our GitHub repository, uh, under System Health Session, you will find the Power BI uh, desktop file, which has the information about uh, getting a similar kind of view, but just for the System Health Session. Awesome. Great. So, uh, to summarize. As I said, uh, 
works. All of this information provides a very easy way of consuming the data that's already available in your SQL Server instance. Uh, we get a lot of questions uh, from uh, uh, SQL Server customers about how to uh, interpret latency in their environment and also uh, why did it actually fail over. Um, sometimes uh, the conclusion is uh, that there's not, uh, there's not sufficient data available to do root cause analysis. But uh, before you arrive at that conclusion, uh, I would always urge you to look at your SQL Server error logs, the always on health sessions, the system health session, and the failover cluster diagnostic logs along with the cluster logs uh, to find out what information is there. Uh, the failover cluster diagnostic logs, uh, uh, the XCL files stay around for longer. Uh, just the Windows cluster log is prone to overwrite very quickly unless you have uh, made uh, uh, changes or changed the default configuration uh, to retain them for a longer period. Uh, but what I'm showing you right now has helped us a lot in a lot of uh, situations where customers have called us after the failover has happened and not uh, immediately some of them have called us after two or three days uh, to do root cause analysis and those logs definitely help. Um, so that's all I had for uh, today's session. Um, if you're attending SQL Pass, uh, uh, come join us uh, at our session. We're delivering uh, another session on uh, always on enhancements. Uh, always on availability group enhancements. Uh, the session code is DBA313M. Uh, so we're going to talk about all the different enhancements that we put together in uh, SQL Server 2016. We're going to show you uh, cool visualizations like this. Uh, we're working on uh, pushing something into uh, Management Studio as well. Um, we hope to show you that as well, uh, along with uh, uh, some other cool demos. And um, uh, those are our contact details. Um, are we. My, that's my personal blog, troubleshootingsql.com. The team blog is uh, aka.ms SQL Server Team. Uh, we are available on Twitter at uh, MS SQL Tiger. Um, Banner Geomet is my personal Twitter handle. And all the uh, scripts for the demo that I showed today, uh, along with the Power BI desktop files, are available on the uh, Tiger Toolbox uh, Microsoft repository. Um, yeah, feel free to download them. If you want to make changes, go ahead, uh, make changes, uh, uh, contribute back to our repository, uh, submit a pull request. Uh, we will review and approve, approve it as appropriate. And uh, thank you, everyone, for joining today. Uh, it was uh, great having the opportunity to present to you and talk to you about uh, some of the uh, supportability stuff that we're doing. Uh, and it's always good to connect with the community. And, and thank you, John, for setting this up. I appreciate it a lot. No problem. Thank you for giving us great content. We greatly appreciate it. And hopefully everyone will be able to take advantage of your session that you're going to be doing at the past summit here in, gosh, I think it's two weeks now. It's coming up pretty quickly. Wow, yes. I know I'll be there. Yep. <laughs> it's around the corner. Yeah, me as well. Alrighty, with that, um, we'll go ahead and we'll wrap up today's session. Everyone, uh, thank you for attending, and we'll look forward to seeing everyone next month. Thanks a lot, everybody. Thanks. Thank you. Have a good day.